Welcome to our review on interdependence between organisms. So what we need to understand here then is the relationship between different organisms. So first of all, let's consider our predators as a group. When we're talking about a predator, we're referring to an animal that hunts another animal. So be careful with this one. You'd be amazed at how many times I've been told in exam answers that the predator is a rabbit. A rabbit doesn't have to hunt the grass, remember, okay? It's not like as the rabbit approaches, the grass uproots and runs off down the road. A predator has to be hunting another animal. Now, what we tend to find is there are a few characteristic features of our predators. First one is they've got binocular vision. So that means their eyes are on the front of their head and that allows them to judge distance and judge size. Both important things when we're hunting. They need to be strong and also be relatively fast in order to be able to chase their prey. They need to be camouflaged to blend in with their surroundings to be able to stalk up and have a better shot at getting that prey. They also need good senses to be able to detect it in the first instance. When we're thinking about the actual killing of the prey, then they need large teeth and sharp claws for holding and obviously the killing stage. We will find that their behavior is slightly different as well. They will either hunt in a pack or if they hunt alone, they will use stealth methods to do that. So creeping up very quietly to then allow them to get as close as possible to the prey before they strike. And the last thing there is that when they give birth, they will only have small numbers of young because that means that they don't have to catch so much food in order to support that young litter. If we now turn our attention to the prey, and remember prey is an animal that is hunted by another animal as food, so prey will never be a plant, then what we find is they've also got these characteristic features. They've got monocular vision, which means their eyes are on the side of their head to give them better all round vision. They need to be quick to obviously escape should a predator appear. They've got a herd lifestyle, which means that they tend to sort of stand around in large groups because that means that they're less likely to be picked off by a predator coming in. Some cases they'll have some kind of defense mechanism like stings or poison. They have also need to be able to camouflage so the predator can't find them. They will have large numbers of young when they give birth. And this is down to the fact that not all of them are going to survive. So it gives them a much better chance of at least some of them making it. And the young will be born simultaneously, again meaning that they can be cared for amongst the herd and minimise the risk of there being the odd little one to be picked off by any predators nearby. So wherever we have predators and prey, we've got a relationship between them. And perhaps the best example of this that you've probably studied in your lessons is the relationship between the snowshoe hare and the Canadian lynx. So you've probably all seen this graph many times before. Now, what we actually find is if we look at that graph, we can see that when the prey population increases, not long after, the population of lynx also increases. So what we see is that there is this relationship that as the prey increase, the predators will also increase. Then when the prey decrease, the predators decrease. So what we find is that there is this relationship between predator and prey. But what we need to obviously understand is the difference between the kind of question they're going to ask you about this. If they ask you to describe the relationship between predator and prey in the graph, then that's where you're literally going to be saying that as the number of prey increases, then the number of predators increase. And as the number of prey decrease, the number of predators also decrease. The other thing to pick out there is that there's always a slight gap, okay, between those two being seen. So if you put that, you've got your description. If the question was to say, explain the relationship, then not only would you give the description as we've already done, but you'd say why we see that. So for example, as opposed to just saying that when the population of the prey increase, then the predators will increase, you add on, this is because there is more food available. So the lynx population could increase because there's more food available to support them. If we're looking at why they decrease when the number of our prey decrease, we can obviously mention the fact that there's less food available, so they're going to starve. So make sure that if it's a describe, you just say what you see. If it's an explain, say what you see and why we see that using science. As I've already mentioned, the reason that we get this slight delay between the change in one and the change in the other is because it takes a while for that impact to be seen. If the prey numbers drop, it's going to take a while 
for obviously that lack of food to actually go through into the death of your predators. So remember there is always that slight delay between the change in one and then the resulting change in the other. We should also be aware about a couple of other relationships we see between living things. First one is described as a mutualism. So in a mutualistic relationship, both organisms will benefit. And the picture I've given you in the bottom left there is of our buffalo and of an oxpecker. So the oxpecker is the little bird you can see sitting on there. And what they do is they feed off of things like parasites that you find on the buffalo. And because they're removing the parasites, obviously the buffalo benefits. And because the oxpecker is also getting a nice food supply there, then it's going to benefit too. So that's a mutualistic relationship. Both of them are benefiting. The other type of relationship is parasitism. So this is where one organism benefits at the cost of the other or the cost of its host. And the bottom right there, you can see a lovely picture of a tapeworm. So tapeworms then will get inside the body and then they're going to embed themselves into the wall of the gut. And you can see the lovely hooks and suckers on the head there that allows them to do that. Then as they're living in the gut of their host, what they'll be doing is stealing all of those nutrients being taken in by their host animal and they therefore will benefit. But it is at the cost of the host because any nutrients the tapeworm gets, the host doesn't. We need to bear in mind it's not just animals that show these relationships, but plants too. So what we find is that with plants, we tend to see a lot of mutualistic relationships with bacteria. So we've got those nitrogen fixing bacteria mentioned when we looked at the nitrogen cycle that live in the roots of those leguminous plants such as clover and peas. Those bacteria will convert nitrogen from the air into nitrates, which obviously benefits the plant because they can take up those nitrates into their actual root systems. And the bacteria will gain food from the plant cells. So both benefit, therefore it's a mutualistic relationship.